Got your Bibles? <clears throat> Got your Bibles? Yes. Come on now, you can talk to the choir, you can talk to me. <laughs> Let me see them, raise them up there. Okay. No matter what version of the Bible you have, I want your name in it because that's your Bible. That's God's word and God's gift to you. So put your, put your name in your Bible so that if you leave it at church and they find it, they'll be able to call you and tell you you left your Bible. Nahum chapter one. Nahum chapter one. You say, well, I don't know where Nahum is. Well, Nahum is in heaven, but his book, if you want to know where it is, go to the front of your Bible and look under concordance. And it's over in the left-hand side and it's right after Isaiah and all of that, and it's in the middle of all those hard names. Nahum chapter 1. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we do thank you for what we've already heard and what we've already experienced today. And I would pray, God, in a very real way today. Please. You speak. Help me get out of the way. So the hearts and the spirits of these your people might be open. They might experience you today. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I had a younger man's clothes on that day, I had been called into our nation's service doing a job nobody wanted to do and wasn't a lot of reward for it. It's my job on that June day in 1970 to go into the ocean with four other sailors and two Navy SEALs and we were to make sure that 650 Marines would get to the place that they were supposed to get to safely and with all dispatch. That was our job. And did I tell you that's the first time I'd done it? And did I tell you I had not been trained to do it, but they told me to do it because I was the youngest officer on that ship that day. I want you to know they all got there safely. And they all went inland. That's all I know about that. But as the sun began to set and day's end was coming, we got to call to come back to our ship to get back on board. It'd been a long day, it'd been a hard day, and so we were excited and elated to get back, take a shower, get a good meal, and get in bed. But unbeknownst to us, and I don't know if anybody else knew it or not, a front had moved in and the swells in the ocean that day were about 15 feet. That's a lot of ocean. And so our job was to pull our boat up next to the ship. They would lower two big hooks down. We had what we called stanchions down in the bottom of the boat, and we were to lock those hooks in, and then they would hoist us on the ship. Got all our equipment, all our boat, and all of us on there. There was no way we could have climbed a ladder anyway, so that was the best way to do it. But what happened was when we got there, we were going up and down, and up and down. And our boat was hitting against the side of the ship. Boom. And the ship was hitting the side on our boat. Boom. And it was very difficult to get those hooks locked into place to pull us up there. But what else happened is I had an E5 machinist mate who was able to get one of those hooks locked in 
but nobody on the front end got their hook locked in. And so what happened, we were pulled up, but when the wave went down and we went in the trough, the rear end of the boat stayed up, but the front of the boat went down. And our equipment started to spill out. And we started trying to stay in. Because if you go out of the water, out of the boat into the water, you're going to get under the boat, under the ship, and you're going to die. If you stay in the boat and you don't get that situation taken care of, the ship is going to crush your boat and you're going to die. So what do you do? You don't have but one choice, and that is to get that hook in there and get on the ship or die right there. And so there we were. I don't know how long it took. As far as I'm concerned, it took a lifetime. But we were going up and down, and up and down. And I looked up in one of the down points, and I was holding on, and I had one of those Navy SEALs by the ankle, and he was holding on to somebody else, and I looked up, and all along the railing of the ship, Just like you are, there were people watching to see what was going to happen. Nobody could help us. Nobody was coming to help us. We had to solve the problem then and there or we're going to die. And so in the midst of all that, up another deck and another deck on the wing of the bridge, my captain was watching this. My captain in the midst of this, said, I heard his voice. Nobody else was saying anything. I heard his voice say, I want those men on this ship now. I have a meal waiting for them. There was in my boat... Navy SEALs, need I say more, senior petty officers, need I say more, and one skinny E3 unremarkable kid that I think a judge had said either go to the Navy or you're going to get put in jail. (laughs) And he dove into the bottom of that boat and he got that hook And he got that stanchion, and if he doesn't get it in there, it's going to cut his arm off. And he put that in there, and they brought us up on the ship. Obviously, I didn't die. People, ordinary people, people like you, people like me, do extraordinary things when they hear their captain's voice. You have a captain. His name is Jehovah, Yahweh, God, Yeshua, Jesus, the Holy Spirit that is in you right now. God Almighty is our captain. Hopefully, you understanding that we are in desperate times in our world hopefully you've heard your captain's voice that says I have a meal waiting on you I want you to come up and get in my house and eat my meal and sit at my table That's what Nahum is saying. He's saying ordinary people must do extraordinary things. Not to thrive, but just to survive until God calls us home and make sure that we are faithful to the end. First thing I want you to see today is a meeting with God. A meeting with God. Nahum chapter 1, verse 1, the oracle, oracle, by the way, is a a speech. It's an utterance. 
It's like something that would come from a pagan god or pagan idol. So he's saying the oracle, this is God speaking. This is what God is saying. The oracle of Nineveh, by the way, that's not Israel. Nineveh is ancient Assyria. Nineveh is, a, it would be like me saying, uh, God is speaking in Tehran today and I'm down here amongst all these folks. That's what he's saying. The oracle of Nineveh, Nineveh the book of vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite, and he says that to say, I want you to know I'm real. I have feelings. I have a heart. I have a vision. I'm a prisoner of war. I'm an alien. I'm in a foreign land. I'm trapped in here. I can't get out. But God is here with me. And God is speaking. And this is what God is saying to me. And I'm telling you, this is what God is saying. I want you to listen. I am not being political, but I am a believer. I am called by Jesus Christ to be a preacher of the Word of God. And when I turn on the news and I hear out of their mouths, not somebody else said, out of their mouths that they are offended the liberal Democrats are offended because a Jewish Messianic rabbi prayed in the name of Yeshua, that's Jesus, God who has come in the flesh. That's the heart of our gospel. That's the heart of our faith. And then they're offended because he preached in the name of Jesus Christ and prayed in the name of Jesus Christ. Then I know that I am in an alien land. The time has come for us to pack our bags because Jesus better come and get us very quick or they're going to kill every one of us. The oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. No, by the way, I'm not going to tell you to vote Tuesday because Will's going to tell you that here in just a minute. And by the way, I can say anything I want to because I don't have a tax exempt status. <laughs> and by the way, Mark has already said he will not cut my social security. So. <laughs> Listen, if you want a word from God, this is where you've got to go. If you've got a word from God, want a word from God, this is where you've got to be. You cannot survive, you cannot thrive, you cannot be fulfilled, you cannot be content, you, will, you cannot be, be, we would call it happy, without a daily dose of the word of God. This Bible, this, and you've got to get it on your own. This Bible is more important to your well-being than insulin is to a diabetic. What you are digesting in this world will kill you, will destroy you, will rob you of everything you are and everything you will ever, ever be. Gregory of Nyssa lived in the 4th century AD. He's considered to be one of the church fathers and because of him and people like him, your faith is real today and you're sitting here enjoying the fact that he left something to succeeding generations. This is what he said. As no darkness can be seen by anyone surrounded by light, so no trivialities can capture the attention of anyone who has his eyes on Christ. What are we talking about? If you do not walk in the light, the light being Jesus Christ, if you do not walk into the light of, of the word of God, not only will you believe a lie, you will believe every lie. And those lies are like acid to your system. They will destroy your future, your family, your hope, your health, everything about you. 
will die forever. That's a meeting with God. It's absolutely necessary. But secondly, I want you to see a message from God. Verse 2, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. By the way, that word jealous is an expression of anger, but it comes from the passion of God. God is passionate about you. God does not want to make you happy. God wants to make you his. Do you hear that? God does not want to make you happy. God wants to make you his because if you are his, you will be holy. And if you'll be holy, you're his and you will be happy. You will be content. You will be satisfied. You will be uh, uh, passionate about God. So the passion of God is our eternity, our soul. He made us to have communion with him forever and forever. So how you view God determines not only who you are, but how you think. There's been a new book came out that the, that the body has memory. They have shown that whatever you're exposed to, ideologically, experientially, affects your DNA. You become part of that. And so as a result of that, if you're exposed to God on a daily basis through his word, by his word, through walking with him, then you become not only godly, but you develop a thirst and a hunger for God. You understand what I'm saying? It all makes sense. It's all lined up. And so what God is passionate about is you. You and that jealousy is 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 something. It's 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 not like he's jealous of a, a, a controlling husband. Well, where you been? Who are you with? Who'd you talk to today? What'd you say? Well, well let me see your cell phone. That's not what he was talking about. Do you think God didn't know about cell phone technology before we did? That's not what God is talking about. It's not controlling. It is blessing. It is blessing because God knows you can exist without him. And that word vengeance means, does, mean, does not mean that he's mad at you, that he's angry with you. No, 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 no. It means that you have developed an attitude so that you, uh, you cannot, you literally do not have the ability to come in to the presence of God and experience him. You don't want to come to church. The Sabbath day is not holy to you anymore. Sabbath day is something for you to enjoy so you can entertain your flesh. And so God says, I want you to know that I care greatly about you. And if you want to be content and fulfilled, this is what you've got to do. Matthew 22, 37, 30, 22, 37, Jesus said, Jesus said, you shall, you shall love. And that word love is not, oh, I love you. That word love is not, I love spaghetti. That's not what it is. That word love is covenant love. It is a deep-seated commitment, emotion, feeling, thought process that moves you to do something of eternal consequences. It moves your feet. You hear that? You shall love the Lord your God, what? With all your heart. That's your emotions. That's how you feel. You're to love him with your feelings. You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. That's the essence of you. That's, that's your spirit. That's, that's your DNA. That's, that's why you smell the way you smell. That's, that's your chemical makeup. It's everything about you 
You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's your intellect. Now, now back up just a little bit. And let's remember we're talking about Nahum. Nahum literally means comforter. He is there to comfort a people who are in an alien land. And so Nahum is a type of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament that Jesus says lives in you. The Holy Spirit has come to bring healing to your life. And that doesn't mean you get sick and then you get better. He does do that. But it means more than that. Healing means wholeness, perpetuity, eternity. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit, love is covenant love that gives you an action. Susie. Susie's not her real name. And you don't know her. And she, she doesn't live around here, so she won't be coming to your Sunday school class next Sunday, okay? This is not Dr. Phil. Susie woke up one morning after being married for 25 years to an emotionally, intellectually, financially, you know where this is going, abusive man who totally controlled her life and had, listen, stolen her mind, her spirit. You see, that's what the devil is. The devil is a time thief. The devil is a spirit thief. Now, come on, put your face on. Those of you that are living in an abusive relationship, I know you, and I know what you're going to say. You're putting on a face to protect that devil. So put your face on, but let your heart listen to what God is saying. Susie woke up, and it dawned on her that she didn't even know what she liked to eat. She didn't know what she liked to cook. She had lost her creativity. She had lost everything about her because of what this man had subjected her to over the years. And so what does Jesus say to Susie? And what does Jesus say to you? Maybe you're not Susie. Maybe you're a Ben who has been dominated and controlled by his work. Or maybe you're a, a, a Mary who has been controlled and dominated by her illness. There are things that want to steal your life. But Jesus wants to give you life. How does he do that? How does he do that? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. You're going to have to learn how to love God before you can love another. And you're going to have to learn how to love God before you can love another, before you can love yourself. You know what you like. You know who you are. And you're going to have to find your identity. You listening? You listening? So how do you do that? The psalmist tells us you've got to meditate on the work. You don't spend your time watching television. You don't spend your time on the Internet. You don't spend your time doing this, that, and the other. You spend your time in the Word of God on a daily basis, and you meditate on it over and over and over. And if you want to know where to start, start with, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That little old seaman that day looked at me and he said, Mr. Brown, we're in trouble and we ain't gonna make it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And what we do so often, we come to God only in prayer, only when we're in trouble. And if you don't think you're in trouble today, you're in more trouble than you've ever been in your life. You're in trouble. You're in deep, deep trouble. You're living in a nation that's under the judgment 
of God. And so my job here today is not to try to change the pagans. My job here today is to equip you to get heaven into you so that you can get into heaven. You hear that? God is pleading with you today. He wants the deep thoughts of your heart. He does not want some, some abusive mate controlling you, telling you what you can eat and what you can wear and where you can go and, and when you have to get back home and, and all of that. He wants to tell you, why don't you just come and spend some time with me today? You can't live without God. Then lastly, lastly, did you get that? Did you get that? If you got that, then I want you to promise God tomorrow morning or this afternoon that you're going to get alone with God and you're going to pray and you're going to pour your heart out to God. And let me tell you what, if you're living with, with an abusive mate, all hell will break out because he or she does not want you giving attention to anybody but them. Are you listening? When you do that, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to pray for me because I literally exist because of your prayers. We're there, aren't we? Verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger, great in power, but, watch this, the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. I looked at that whirlwind and I looked at that storm and I thought about it. Man, we're in a storm. I'm in a storm. You're in a storm. I'm in trouble. You're in trouble. What am I going to do? And I was reminded of what that Jewish guide told me that day we were standing up on Masada and looking down over the Judean desert. You could see a storm coming in. A storm, you could see the clouds rolling and rolling and rolling. And then that, 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 that God said, watch the eagle. Watch the eagle. Watch the eagle. We'd have never been able to do that if our bus hadn't broke down. See, God's even in a broken down bus. And so I watched that eagle. And that eagle waited and waited and waited. And then he spread those wings and when those thermals came in like that, he got on a thermal and he went like that. And he went higher. He went higher. He went higher. He went so high, we couldn't even see him anymore. In fact, I imagine that he went so high that he went by an El Al jetliner and winked at him. The wind in the desert is the ruach. It's the same Hebrew word they give for the wind of God, the spirit of God, as he blows through your life this morning. I want to spread, spread my wings. I want you to spread, spread your wings and ride that ruach up and up and up and up and I want to reach out and I want to touch the face of God. And one day God will catch me and say come on home with me. We're closer to my house than we are yours. And by the way, you were never meant 
for this world. You were meant for mine. Susie, are you listening? Troubled soul, are you listening? Spread your wings. Get into that word. and Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. Matthew's going to come and do an invitation here in a minute, but the invitation starts right now. You're in the house of prayer. You're in the house of God. It's time to talk. It's time to talk. Nobody can tell you what to say. Nobody can tell you what to think. You're free in this house. Nobody has anything on your time right now. You're free in this house, and God is listening. And you don't have to explain to anybody what you prayed here today. You're free in this house. You want to be saved? You want to know Jesus? The altar's open during this invitation. You want to join this church? You can't live this by yourself. You can't do this alone. You can't, you can't do this on a golf course on Sunday. You can't do this laying at home in bed. You can't do this on the internet, by the way. This is something personal, and you can't do it alone. You want to be a part of this church? Get in a Sunday school class. You want to come? And just pray this morning. Just get on this altar and pray. Not because you've got something that you need to repent, but it's just time for you to start talking to God. Why don't you just get up and start coming right now and just pray and pour your heart out to God. How long has it been since you did that? Father, during this time of invitation, I pray that we would sense the urgency of the situation and we would say, help me, God. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Stay.